At this time, we'd like to introduce you also to Dr. Catherine Tuttle. She serves as the Executive Director for Research at Providence Healthcare. She's a professor of medicine at the University of Washington, and she's the co-principal investigator for the Institute for Translational Health Sciences. Dr. Tuttle also gave a special presentation on diabetic kidney diseases to the American Association of Kidney Patients. Because this issue, diabetic kidney disease, is such a profound issue in the kidney community and for patients that are being diagnosed at an increasingly earlier age and in minority communities, we think it's especially important to provide as much programming as possible in this area. This is now our presentation of Dr. Tuttle on this same issue, diabetic kidney disease. Hello. I'd like to thank the American Association of Kidney Patients and George Washington University for the opportunity to present here at the second annual Global Kidney Summit. I'm Dr. Katherine Tuttle, and I'm pleased to talk about treatment for CKD and diabetes, and I'll be basing my presentation on the newly released KDGO guidelines that have recently been updated based upon emerging clinical evidence in this field. Here are my disclosures. My objectives today will be to review therapeutic approaches for treatment of chronic kidney disease and diabetes, to recognize use of newer glucose lowering agents to reduce chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular risks, and to discuss the importance of comprehensive care for patients with diabetes and CKD. I'd first like to start off with the definition because oftentimes people are confused about what is diabetic kidney disease versus diabetic nephropathy. Well, they're really not interchangeable terms. So diabetic kidney disease, also known as DKD, is a clinical diagnosis based upon albuminuria, low estimated GFR, or both in diabetes. So DKD is really chronic kidney disease and diabetes, but not a specific pathologic phenotype. Whereas diabetic nephropathy is used to specify classic glomerular lesions in diabetes, such as glomerular basement membrane thickening, mesangial expansion and nodules, potocytes loss, and endothelial disruption. So for the purpose of this discussion, we will be talking about DKD or CKD and diabetes because the clinical trials that have informed this update have been based on a clinical diagnosis, not on a specific pathologic phenotype. So first off, I'd like to start with a consideration of what are the risks of diabetic kidney disease. In nephrology, our conventional focus has been on progression to end-stage kidney disease, clearly a very important endpoint. However, only 10% of patients who develop diabetic kidney disease will progress to end-stage kidney disease. Instead, most will actually die of other causes without reaching end-stage kidney disease. About half of cardiovascular diseases, but importantly, a third of infections, particularly of pneumonia and sepsis, which are particularly relevant now in the era of COVID-19, and we will be awaiting uh, the results of what happens to this high-risk group uh, in the COVID era, which will probably become an even bigger issue as we go forward. I'd like to start out with the fact that despite the serious risk of diabetic kidney disease, there are very low rates of, of kidney disease awareness and detection in the current era. And this is true whether or not a person has diabetes. So as you'll see on the left panel, this shows awareness over the past 20 years. And even in patients at the highest risk of end-stage kidney disease, awareness is still only about 40% among patients and providers alike. As a result, we're doing very poorly with detection. In two large US healthcare systems with a cohort of about 2.6 million patients between 20, 2006 and 2017, Albuminuria or proteinuria was measured in only 15% of patients with diabetes and CKD, and in just 5% of patients with diabetes who were at risk and did not yet have CKD. So in order to improve outcomes, we have to clearly do a much better job of being aware and detecting the condition to begin with. The KDGO guidelines start out with the fundamentals of providing comprehensive care to patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And as you can see at the bottom of the pyramid, it really rests on healthy lifestyle as well as control of condition, conventional risk factors for chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. That includes glycemic control, blood pressure control, and lipid management. And now we're recommending for most patients that they also receive an SGLT2 inhibitor, along with the renin-angiotensin system inhibitor for kidney protection. 
and in some patients, antiplatelet therapies to reduce the cardiovascular risk. And again, I will remind you that cardiovascular diseases are more common than kidney disease events. So we really need to be addressing both of these important conditions if we want to improve outcomes that matter to patients. With regard to lifestyle, clearly healthy lifestyle is fundamental to treatment of both diabetes and CKD. And we have recommended that a protein intake be limited to 0.8 gram per kilo per day for those with diabetes and non-dialysis CKD. Higher levels of protein have been associated with CKD progression. And this level of protein intake will maintain good nutrition while at the same time not increasing the risk of kidney disease progression. We'd also like to emphasize the importance of plant proteins because for any given amount of protein, plant proteins are more kidney protective than animal proteins. Once patients start hemodialysis, there are protein losses and catabolic conditions that uh, occur with dialysis and they then need a higher protein intake, which is why we then switch to recommending more than a gram and up to 1.2 gram per kilo per day. The other important lifestyle intervention that is critical for patients with diabetes and CKD is limiting sodium intake to less than two grams per day. This has been around for a long time, but considering the importance of blood pressure control on mitigating CKD progression in diabetes, we are emphasizing the importance of limiting sodium intake and have provided some practical tips about how to do this. We'd also like to emphasize that the current standard of care really is an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. And this standard of care has been in place for some 20 years since the original National Kidney Foundation KDOKI guidelines came out for diabetes and CKD. And the importance of initiating these therapies because nearly 20 years in, we're still falling short on treating most of the patients who would benefit. We also have some recommended strategies for mitigating risks such as hyperkalemia or an increase in creatinine with the goal of trying to keep patients on these therapies whenever possible. And that the, we would reduce or stop these agents only as a last resort if we haven't been able to manage these complications. These were the original uh, trials in type 2 diabetes and CKD that evaluated the angiotensin receptor blockers. You can see these public studies were published in 2001, so nearly 20 years out. Uh, and these were the last treatments uh, prior to SGLT2 inhibitors that had been approved for the treatment of CKD and diabetes. One tested uh, <clears throat> Losartan in the renal trial and Herbisartan in the IDNT trial. And while risk was reduced, you can see the risk reductions were modest, 16 and 20% respectively leaving a very large absolute residual risk. Now, how well are we doing with the standard of care? Not nearly well enough. This is another report from Cure CKD on medication use in patients with CKD in two large US healthcare systems, the UCLA and the Providence healthcare systems across five Western states. And as you can see, while ACE inhibitor and ARB uh, use increased over time, even in the most recent era, only about 14% of patients with uh, CKD overall were receiving an ACE or an ARB. And in those with diabetes, CKD, and hypertension, perhaps the hardest indication to use these agents, ACE inhibitor or ARB use was just 25%. So one of the reasons that our patients are not uh, benefiting as much as they could is that uh, we are underutilizing the only agents that we had approved uh, for diabetic kidney disease in the past 20 years. And even among those who have received them, the risk reduction is relatively modest and not more than 20%. So clearly there has been an enormous unmet need for better treatments. There have been many new therapies under study for diabetic kidney disease. Uh, time does not permit us to have a detailed discussion but I just wanted to give you a, an example of the kind of approaches that have been taken. But where we've really seen deliverance is actually with the newer antihyperglycemic agents. And at the time these studies first came out, they were rather a surprise, but they really delivered in remarkable ways that we haven't seen in some two decades. This is just showing the clinical trials of diabetes drugs over just over the past seven years. This is 2013 to 2020. So as you can see, we've studied an enormous number of these agents. 
Now, um, most recently, the drugs of particular interest have been the SGLT2 inhibitors shown in the pink box and the GLP-1 receptor agonists shown in the orange boxes. These trials have mostly focused on cardiovascular safety and then cardiovascular efficacy, but importantly, they generated data from secondary outcomes on kidney disease that showed remarkable benefits that, again, at the time these studies first came out, were quite surprising. And then the CREDENCE trial reported last year was the first trial with an SGLT2 inhibitor conducted in patients with diabetic kidney disease, which was the first time in the history of nephrology we've had a trial stop early because of overwhelming benefit. And that's what I'll be talking about next. So first off, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you the USA Today headliner version and then show you selected data to back up the claims. So first off, in the cardiovascular outcome trials of these agents in type 2 diabetes, not only did we learn that they were safe from a cardiovascular perspective, but they also delivered in terms of superiority, meaning they reduced risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. And these include the three-point MACE, that is the so-called atherosclerotic events of myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular death. But most importantly, they have significantly reduced the risk of heart failure events. And for two of the three agents tested so far, have also been shown to reduce cardiovascular deaths. With regard to kidney disease, across the board, they decreased macroalbuminuria, decline in GFR, and end-stage kidney disease. And even in patients with pre-existing kidney disease, these cardiovascular benefits and kidney disease benefits are present. So they really hit the sweet spot in patients with CKD who are at risk of both of these important outcomes and, and deliver what we want, reduced rates of death and among the living, maintaining better health. This is uh, the main result from the CREDENCE trial. This trial was conducted in people with diabetes and CKD with EGFR between 30 and 90 and macroalbuminuria with U UACR or albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 300 uh, and less than 5,000 milligram per gram. And these patients all received the standard of care. So in contrast to usual practice, 99.9% .9 of patients in credence were receiving an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And on top of that standard of care, there's another 30% reduction in the major outcome, which was end-stage kidney disease, serum creatinine doubling, a marker of kidney disease progression, and death attributed to either CKD or CVD. As I pointed out, this was the first trial stopped for overwhelming efficacy. And I'd also like to point out that the FDA uh, approved canagliflozin, the agent used in the CREDENCE trial, for the treatment of diabetic kidney disease and included not only the indication to reduce kidney disease endpoints, but also to reduce CVD death. And this is the first time we've ever had a drug approved to prevent death in patients with kidney disease. So this was really a landmark study for multiple reasons. This is just showing the primary outcome by various subgroups at different levels of GFR, higher and lower albuminuria, and the, the benefits are clear across the strata of eGFR and albuminuria. In a subsequent meta-analysis that included the cardiovascular outcome trials where the CKD endpoints were secondary and the CREDENCE trial in which they were primary, you see across the board, however we wanted to combine the events, there was a benefit of the SGLT2 inhibitor class shown by the large diamond to the left of the line of unity showing reduced risk. There had been a theoretical concern that SGLT2 inhibitors could reduce, uh, could increase risk of AKI, and whether in the CREDENCE trial shown on the right, uh, the bottom uh, bullet in the, in the forest plot, or in the meta-analysis with the CREDENCE data combined with the cardiovascular outcome data, we actually see reduced risk of acute kidney injury in the range of 25%. So not only are the agents safe from an AKI perspective, they actually are beneficial in terms of reducing risk of acute kidney injury. How might this be working? The first cardiovascular outcome trial to report kidney outcomes was the infrared trial shown on the left. As you can see, the baseline GFR was 76 because these patients were selected for heart disease, not kidney disease risk. And uh, from this baseline of relatively normal GFR in the placebo group shown in gray, you see progressive decline over time 
Whereas in the impetrated patients, whether at the higher or lower dose, we see an abrupt initial decline in GFR of about 5 mL per minute, but then this stabilizes over time so that by the end of the observation period, GFR was higher in the impetrated patients than in the placebo patients. When we look to Credence, a group that was selected for kidney disease, you can see they start with a lower baseline GFR as expected, 56, but you still see the pattern of the abrupt early decline, about 5 mL per minute of eGFR with stabilization over time. This really harkens to a hemodynamic mechanism, really the only explanation for an abrupt decline so quickly within a week or two of starting the agents, but preservation in kidney function over time. This is just a reminder of some renal physiology about why this might be so. And um, I'd first like to start out with a, a review of what happens to renal hemodynamics in uh, diabetes. Early in diabetes, we see an actual increased GFR or glomerular hyperfiltration. But even when GFR declines, remnant nephrons or remaining function units in the kidney are still hyperfiltering at the single nephron unit level. This is because blood flowing into the uh, capillary, the glomerulus, is uh, increased because of dilation of the inflowing or afferent arteriole and because the downstream or outflowing arteriole is relatively constricted. So when I teach our medical students, I use a a, a faucet and hose analogy and that the upstream end is like having the faucet turned on and the downstream end is like kinking the hose so that in between there's very high pressure. And we know, we have known for 40 years, this is a major mechanism of progressive kidney injury and diabetes. When we give an ACE or an ARB, they decompress the glomerulus by dilating the downstream artery, unkinking the hose, but we still have the inflowing artery at at pumping blood into the glomerulus at a higher than normal level. In diabetes, there's also increased glucosuria, which is taken up in the proximal convoluted tubule by receptors called SGLT2 transporters. These transporters also take up sodium with glucose, so that in diabetes, because of the increased uptake of glucose in the proximal tubule, there's increased uptake of sodium such that downstream in the tubule, there's less delivery of sodium chloride to the segment called the distal convoluted tubule shown in the figure uh, by the little box area. And in the specialized area called the macula densa, less sodium is taken up because less is delivered. And this has a very important effect on the inflowing artery. If you look at the blown up box, the uptake of sodium in this segment requires active transport by a sodium potassium ATPase. When ATP is used, it generates adenosine, but adenosine is not a waste product in this situation. In a paracrine fashion, meaning right next door, it moves from the macula densa to a receptor on the inflowing artery where it basically turns down the faucet. It's a relative vasoconstrictor. So when we give an SGLT2 inhibitor shown on the right, we block glucose and sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. More of these solutes transit downstream to the distal tubule, the macula densa where the box is. We restore sodium uptake. We start using ATP, generating adenosine, and we clamp down the inflowing artery. So we take care of the other limb of this. This is why we think the combination of an ACE inhibitor or an ARB with an SGLT2 inhibitor has shown such remarkable effectiveness for reducing CKD progression in diabetes. There are likely many other mechanisms. These, uh, this is not by any means uh, suggesting that this is the only mechanism, but it is a major mechanism and one that we can understand in terms of how these agents work in terms of driving CKD progression. Time will not permit a detailed discussion of other mechanisms, but this one is clinically relevant and has implications for how we actually apply the therapies. This is just showing the main cardiovascular outcomes in the credence population. On the top, we have CDD, death, and heart failure in a primary and secondary prevention cohort. In the bottom, the MACE, the atherosclerotic events. And in both primary and secondary prevention cohorts, we see benefit. 
This was the first time that a primary prevention cohort, that is a group of patients who did not yet have a cardiovascular event, were shown to have kidney protection. The cardiovascular outcome trials only uh, benefit had been shown for primary prevention. So the other thing that Credence delivered was information to the cardiovascular community that these agents could prevent the primary onset of heart disease. And for the kidney disease community, that even in patients with established diabetic kidney disease, we can reduce cardiovascular events and cardiovascular mortality in a group at very high risk. Again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about the interplay between the heart and the kidney, why this drug acting on the kidney would have such profound benefits on the heart. But clearly, the naturetic effect and the diuretic effect are important for heart failure prevention. However, the benefits are beyond what we've seen with other diuretics. So there are many other hypotheses being tested. There's a mild ketosis, which from the standpoint of cardiovascular fuel energetics is favorable, that is beta hydroxybutyrate is a preferred myocardial fuel. There's also reduct increase in oxygen delivery because the kidney begins to make more erythropoietin. So these are things that may improve cardiac function above and beyond what we can account for by naturesis. And again, we don't have time to go into the details of this. These are active areas of investigation, and I'm sure that you'll be hearing more about these uh, potential mechanisms as time goes on. And the mechanisms are important because they will drive the clinical application and optimal use of these agents. Let's now turn to the GLP-1 receptor agonists because they're close on the heels of the SGLT2, and these drugs are also delivering in big ways for our patients. They were similarly studied in the cardiovascular outcome trials for type 2 diabetes, first for safety, but again, they met the safety bar, and now they've been shown to also show superiority with reducing risk of major adverse CBD events. However, their benefits are really confined to atherosclerotic events. There's no harm to heart failure, but no benefit. However, they are very potent in terms of reducing risk of atherosclerotic events, and two agents in the class loraglutide and semaglutide also have indications to prevent cardiovascular death. With regard to the secondary kidney outcomes in the CD outcome trials across the board, they decrease macroalbuminuria, and they've been shown to reduce GFR decline from early to late stage CKD. Unlike the SGLT2 inhibitors, these drugs can be used in patients with very low GFR. SGLT2 inhibitors to date have only had studies report out for patients with GFR as low as 30, whereas in the uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist trials, for example, in the dulaglutide studies, we've gone down to a GFR as low as 15. And these benefits for cardiovascular and kidney disease have been demonstrated in patients with pre-existing CKD, including those with very low GFR down to 15. This is a cardiovascular outcomes trial meta-analysis showing from these studies the effect on kidney disease outcomes. Again, the diamonds to the left of the bar demonstrate benefit, reduced risk. And you can see overall it's about 17%, but remember these are cardiovascular complication, or cardiovascular uh, studies. So they were selected for cardiovascular risk, so less opportunity to reduce kidney disease risk, but everything goes the right direction. When albuminuria is taken out of the endpoint, so the bottom panel just showing worsening of kidney function, a uh, similar magnitude of risk reduction, but just missed statistical significance because in a population of people who don't yet have kidney disease, albuminuria is the more common outcome, therefore easier to impact uh, with a treatment intervention. However, award seven, was a clinical trial of dulaglutide compared against insulin glargine for glycemic control in people with type 2 diabetes who had moderate to severe CKD. So these patients had stage 3 or 4 CKD. If you look at the panel on the left, you see the baseline GFR was 35, much lower than any of the other trials I've shown you, even for the SGLT2 inhibitor class. In the insulin-treated group, you see progressive GFR decline over the one year of the study, whereas the two doses of doula, either higher or lower dose, uh, produce GFR stabilization. And in the right panel, we just show a bar graph of change in GFR at 26 and 52 weeks. And you can see substantial GFR decline in the insulin-treated group 
whereas actually there was no significant decline in EGFR in either of the dual groups, and the between-group comparisons are also highly statistically significant. This is a post, excuse me, this is a pre-specified exploratory analysis where we also looked at so-called hard outcomes of either 40% GFR decline or in-stage kidney disease. And you can see that these events overall were reduced by more than half of the highest dose dual glutide group. And if you look in the, at the subset with macroalbuminuria, the highest risk group, you see that actually the hazard ratio was 0.25, so 75% risk reduction. And this observation held in even the group with the GFR below 30, between 15 and 30. Uh, this paper is winding its way through publication, but these data I can show you because they were presented at both ASN and ADA and uh, are in the public domain. So uh, this gives very strong rationale uh, for testing these agents in a phase three trial. And that in fact has begun, it is the FLOW trial, testing semaglutide, a GLP-1 receptor agonist versus placebo in patients with uh, diabetes and chronic kidney disease down to a GFR of 25. How might this work? Again, we don't have time to go into the details, but yes, there is biological rationale. They work very differently than SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, these agents probably act primarily through an anti-inflammatory mechanism and an antioxidant mechanism. And interestingly enough, this may uh, be mediated not only by resident kidney cells, but also by invading cells such as macrophages and T lymphocytes that are actually recruited into the kidney in a pro-inflammatory mechanism for DKD progression. So to summarize the benefits and harms of SGLT2s and GLP1s, and we actually in the guidelines also show the DPP4 inhibitors for comparison, uh, are shown here. Uh, so where we have the most evidence is actually for SGLT2 inhibitors in terms of uh, particularly heart failure, but also some benefit on atherosclerotic events and clear kidney benefits uh, on reducing risk of end-stage kidney disease and GFR decline. Uh, we do have issues with regard to some side effects, particularly genital, genital mycotic yeast infections and diabetic ketoacidosis possibly amputations with canagliflozin, but we've recommended risk mitigation strategies so that these patients can be safely treated uh, and avoid these uh, side effects. With the GLP-1 receptor agonists, I would say that uh, they are second in line, uh, but mainly because of not enough evidence, not negative evidence. Again, important effect on atherosclerotic, re reducing atherosclerotic effects. No harm for heart failure, but no particular benefit. They are anti-albuminuric, they do slow GFR decline, and we're testing, and hopefully we'll learn soon about their effect on, on hard kidney disease endpoints. The main side effects here are primarily gastrointestinal, nausea and vomiting, and most patients will develop a tolerance to this over time. So starting with a lower dose, coaching them through the initial month or so of treatment usually uh, is successful. The DPP-4 inhibitors just have not delivered in terms of any of the either cardiovascular kidney outcomes. They do lower albuminuria, but this has not translated to effects on GFR or other kidney endpoints. So at this point, they can be an adjunct to glycemic control and can be used with low GFR, but are not believed to have uh, true kidney protective effects like the other two classes. So with regard to the hierarchy of therapy, we're dialing in now again to that pyramid we started with, the base of healthy lifestyle, activity, nutrition, weight management. With regard to glycemic control, if the GFR uh, will tolerate it, metformin still is a first-line therapy, uh, along with an SGLT2 inhibitor. And then uh, for patients who have not achieved glycemic goals, or perhaps who have not had optimal albuminuria reduction, or who cannot tolerate metformin, we then recommend a GLP-1 receptor agonist be considered, and then really everything else uh, down below. So I'll wrap up by saying our long-term standard of care for treatment of CKD and diabetes is an ACE or an ARB, but these agents remain strikingly underutilized in clinical practice, which is an area that needs to be addressed along with new therapies. The new therapy on the block is an SGLT2 inhibitor for CKD and type 2 diabetes with GFR greater than 30. And the indication is not just glycemic control, but more importantly, to prevent GFR decline, in stage kidney disease, heart failure, 
atherosclerotic CBD and CBD death, the big stuff. And in fact, these drugs don't do very much for glycemic control in patients with low GFR, but they're still beneficial for patient protection that is preventing the major events of diabetic kidney disease. GLP-1 receptor agonists are very effective antihyperglycemic agents, even with low GFR in contrast to the SGLT2 inhibitor class. And they also have organ protective effects, uh, primarily preventing atherosclerotic CVD and emerging evidence that they lower at risk of albuminuria and GFR decline, and we'll soon learn if there are true effects on hard endpoints. And finally, we want to emphasize the importance of patient self-management, providing education and team-based care in order to give the full 360 of comprehensive care uh, for the best outcomes for our patients with diabetes and CKD. And with that, I thank you.